Dear students, we're back again, week number two. You have hopefully come through uh, week one successfully, uh, and now we're uh, ramping up for week uh, week two. Um, so let's discuss the things we uh, we hate you. Uh, we have to do in uh, week two. Uh, with me again, uh, Aaron, of course. Uh, Aaron, you're going to do your, your, your second uh, project management and system engineering lecture. What's going to be in there? Uh, yes. Um, well, I hope that uh, all of you have watched uh, last week's uh, lecture, the first one on the uh, project management, so more the organization of the DSE. And this week, uh, we typically give this lecture in the beginning of the week, so I hope that you can also watch this uh, video in the beginning of the week. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot about the requirements. Uh, if all is well, you have received your product guide from your tutor and in that product guide you find a list with user requirements that either has been written down by the tutor or has been given to the tutor by an external client. So that you mean the, the, the top level requirements, the 10, 15 requirements? Uh, yes, exactly. So uh, something like the maximum flight range of this aircraft should be 5,000 kilometers or something like that. Or uh, you should have a noise level that is lower than a certain amount of decibels. So what we want you to do in this uh, second week is actually to prepare for the baseline review. Uh, that is that you are going to critically analyze the uh, requirements that have been given to you. Uh, you have to make sure that all the requirements that are given to you are feasible, are doable. Uh, because if you have a requirement that you cannot meet, you have a so-called killer requirement and that is the, well, basically the end of your project. So what we want you to do is to identify those killer requirements and if there is a need for that, to negotiate with your tutor or with your external client to say, well, can we lower this particular requirement because it is impossible to meet with this. You have okay, to... Okay, okay, but if, if that happens, suppose I have a requirement for a, a short range aircraft, but there is also a requirement for, for a very long range. And then my customer says, yeah, but I really want that. How, how would you do that? Well, if you really want it and you are not absolutely certain that you cannot meet with that requirement, I would so challenge accept it, right? So then you go for it and try to uh, yeah, squeeze out every bit of performance from your uh, design that you can meet with both requirements. Okay, so it's probably going to be a bit of negotiation and gonna, a bit of give and take between you and the tutor or the client. Exactly. And of course, it will help that uh, if you have started, hopefully last week, you have started your literature study so that you are aware of the capabilities of competing aircraft, for instance, uh, that you realize, yeah, well, this one is a completely ridiculous requirement. So we for sure will never be able to meet that one. So you have to tell your tutor, this is something that we cannot do and for this and this reason. Of course, you have to motivate that you cannot meet with that requirement. Uh, but... Uh, if you don't negotiate or renegotiate these requirements, we expect you till the very end of the DZ that you will be able to design an aircraft or a spacecraft that will meet with all the requirements. So it is crucial for you that you know what you can do and what you can't do so that at the baseline review, the final moment that you can renegotiate your requirements, that you have a set of requirements that are workable for you. Okay, okay, that, 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 that's clear to me. Um, but now I've seen that I have gotten this, this list of top level requirements. They're, they're rather at the top level, that's why they call top level requirements. Yes. Um, but I expect that you would need to detail them uh, in, in much more detail. Uh, yes, exactly. Because you need to go in the end to the subsystem design. Yes, yes. And we already expect that you're going to do that in this, uh, in this second week so that you have an overview of uh, not just a feasible user requirement, but you can translate them to uh, actual system requirements and mission requirements. So from your top level user requirements, you can already identify, well, this is something that is related to, uh, to the system itself. So that's why we call them system requirements. But suppose that you have a range requirement. Yeah, that's typically something from operations that, uh, well, we call that the mission. So that is a mission requirement, a top level mission requirement. And it will be possible, uh, of course, to link the uh, mission requirements to the system requirements because we know that if you want to fly a certain range, you also need a certain propulsion system. And from the propulsion system, you need a certain maximum amount of fuel that you need to cover that distance. So 
in the end, all these requirements are related and they will lead to system level requirements and subsystem level requirements. Okay, uh, yeah, what, what I normally see indeed is that the, from the top level requirements, the students derive a set of a couple of pages of, of detailed requirements. It literally dozens of, of sub level uh, requirements. Uh, Yes, exactly. It is actually quite common that we have uh, up to two or three hundred of these requirements. Now, of course, you don't know all the numbers because a, a good, well-formulated requirement is something like the system shall be able to meet with and then you give a number and a unit for something. Right. So you need to be able to calculate uh, the aspects that are given in this requirement. Now, and if you don't know that, and it might be possible that for many of the requirements you don't know it, mm-hmm. that then typically what we say, we, yeah, you put a TBD, a to be determined in your requirement so that at least you have written it down and you will not forget about it uh, in the next phase of the design process. But it is, of course, much better that the more numbers you have, the more, the, yeah, the easier it will become to do your actual design. Yeah. Yeah, what, what I always advise my, my team is to start right away from day one, build small tools. Uh. Just build an Excel file in which you can play a little bit with the numbers or do some Python programming and slowly but steadily that tool will build to an integrated design tool. And it will also make it possible to later to verify your your, your data, to, to do a verification validation of, of what you have done. And so start building these, these tools right away from the beginning. That, that really helps. Uh. Yes, and you will also see that the further down you go uh, along the, the, let's say the DZ timeline, uh, the more detail you require, of course, for your design process so that you will expand your tools. And it is way easier, of course, to start with a very small tool and then slowly you are going to build on that tool uh, using the right procedures for verification and validation, which you all have uh, learned uh, during SVV. Still have very good memories about that uh, course, I guess. Uh, so uh, in the end, you have a consistent set of design tools. Uh, you have verified your tools. And if your customer says, well, can you prove that what you have calculated or what you have designed is correct? You say, yes, of course we can, because we have here our verification and validation. Okay. Um, I have some other topics. Uh, I think I would like to discuss a little bit on the the market analysis and also the sustainability analysis. Uh, Uh, What we normally have is that we get an assignment from an external client or from the principal tutor, but there will be a product in the end. There will be a wind turbine, there will be a rocket, a satellite, an aircraft. Somehow it has to fit into the market. So it's important to also make a market analysis how your product is going to be competitive uh, because in the end you need to sell that product. If you can't sell it, there's no profit and there will be no money for developing that product. Uh, So doing a, a market analysis right away from the beginning is very important. Try to know your competitors and try to compare them, especially on numbers again, how much range, how much payload, etc. etc. So that's an important thing as well. Another topic is sustainability. And I think it's important to really start thinking on that right away from the from the beginning. But what's your, your view on that? Uh? Yes, uh, that's true. Uh, well, we know uh, that uh, sustainability is, is a hype. It is uh, a buzzword, as we call it. And governments, and uh, but also the market, will not accept a, a design that is unsustainable. Uh, we have to be careful about our planet Earth, and uh, we have to be careful about the people involved. Uh, so it is not just for the design of the product that you do, but it's also for the operations. So you have to have a safe uh, design and also a safe design process. Uh, so indeed, you have to think about sustainability because if you are restricted by this, it might actually lead to a constraint in your design or additional requirements uh, that will, uh, yeah, you will, will not be free to design whatever you like because you have these constraints from sustainability. Yeah, and I think it's even more than a buzzword nowadays. Uh, in the end, we have to protect our planet and make things possible. And as engineers, we need to find solutions uh, for that. But you can take that in a very wide range. Uh, sustainability, if you look at the, the clear definition, it says a sustainable world is a world in which we can fulfill our needs without compromising the ability of future generations to fulfill their needs. Uh, so it doesn't have to do with 
just naming something to be green, but it has to look in long term development of, of yeah, what you want in the society. So it's a very wide topic. Uh, Yes, indeed. And uh, in fact, uh, to go a little bit back to your market analysis, that is actually uh, something, a similar process. Uh, it is not just that you are looking uh, at how your product will fit into the market, but also to find a niche in the market. Uh, if you design something that does not exist yet, uh, obviously uh, penetrating a certain market uh, segment is easier than if you have a lot of competitors. So what we also uh, advise usually is look at, from a very high level, look at your product. If you can come up with a slight additional requirement for something that your system can also do, and uh, this additional requirement will not cost you so much money to improve on, it means that your system is much more versatile and can be uh, way stronger in, uh, in, in the market than uh, if you would just stick to the uh, basic set of requirements that have been given to you. So we always advise, look at the market, try to derive additional requirements and make your product, your final product, a lot stronger. Okay. Um, we have not spoken about the designing itself. Uh I think it's time to start talking about design as well. Uh and I think once you have that, that list of requirements available, that is the moment you can start uh, really brainstorming. I always see that students really want to do the brainstorming, come up with nice designs very, very early in the process without having an understanding of all the detailed requirements. But I think now, by the end of the second week, it's more or less time to, to start that brainstorming process in a serious, uh, serious way. How many concepts would you like to devise normally? Uh, uh, well, yeah. If we tell the students uh, right from the beginning, you have to come up with 200 different concepts, they say, well, no way that we're going to achieve that. Uh, but a different concept does not have to be a concept that is different in all its aspects. Uh, you can have a, an, 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 uh, an aircraft with two engines or with four engines. Now, the aircraft can be the same, but the fact that you have either two or four uh, engines already indicates that you have two different concepts. Now, what we usually want to, uh, to see is that you are going to look at fundamentally different concepts, of course, but you have only maybe four or five branches then from, from the top level. And then you're going to flow down to a lower level, look at some subsystems, critical subsystems, and have all kinds of combinations and variations. And in the end, you will, uh, you will be able to get some 50 or even 100 different uh, concepts. And that is the initial phase for the concept okay. generation. That, that you lay down in probably the design options tree. Yeah. Exactly. So as I mentioned, you have these branches from the top level you go down and you can have all kinds of branches like just like a tree that you are going to expand downwards with all, uh, let's say, lower level detail that will give you a different concept. Okay. Okay, clear. But in the end, uh, after this brainstorm session, you probably want to go on with three, five, six, more or less mature things that you will develop a bit further. Yes, exactly. Because, uh, well, in the end, uh, we will uh, transport this set of concepts that we have to the next phase of the design process, so the midterm design phase or the trade-off phase. Uh, and you cannot analyze, of course, so many concepts. So uh, what we usually uh, suggest is that uh, you have between three and five concepts of which you are pretty certain that they will be feasible and that they, you can achieve or uh, meet with all the requirements. And those are the ones that you're going to analyze in the next phase. That also means that if you have a, a concept that is only slightly infeasible, you already put that one on hold or you cross it out from your design options tree so that in the end you will have only, of course, the, uh, the five concepts maximum that you need for your next phase. Okay, thanks. Uh, let us look uh, at the deliverables. Uh, this week, uh, in the end, you should be getting closer to deliver the, the baseline report. Uh, deadlines, of course, in the, in the schedule uh, for that. And then we'll have the, the baseline review. What, what can we expect from the baseline review? Uh? Yeah, the baseline review is typically the first review that you have uh, in the DZ. There are three reviews. You have the baseline review, the midterm review, and the final review. 
And the baseline review covers actually the work that you have done in the first two weeks. So uh, part of it is the organization of your project, yeah, but you have uh, summarized in your project plan. And the second of uh, most important part is, of course, the review of the requirements. As I mentioned, you want to freeze the requirements, but you want to freeze feasible requirements. So there is a uh, you, you discuss the top level requirements. Uh, and of course, you show already that uh, which concepts that you have generated and the down selection to those feasible concepts that you are going to transport to the next phase. So use this review to get input from your tutor, get input from your coaches, and hopefully your external client, if you have one, is there as well. So in that sense, I want to advise all of you, uh, think of people you might want to uh, invite and do it on time because everybody is very busy. And uh, yeah, if you only do it one day before, then obviously you can re maybe receive a no because people cannot make it then. Uh, so use this review also to get information from uh, other sources than just your tutor and coaches. Yeah, and just to give you a bit of an idea, at the midterm review and the final review, we want all of you to present a part of, of the work you have been doing. In the baseline review, the amount of work is not that much yet. so. Two, three, four presenters probably should be uh, should be enough for that uh, the baseline reviewer. Yeah, and you can actually link this to maybe your personal goals for the DZ. Uh, if you are uh, a little bit scared for presenting, yeah, maybe this is an excellent environment. It is still an educational environment, right? So you can uh, hopefully uh, practice your presentation skills and also get feedback on what you do right and what you might uh, be able to improve. Okay, thank you very much. That, that wraps it up for, for this week. Uh, so we'll see you again uh, next week for week number three. Yeah, okay. Well, best of luck and we see you. Bye.